head of the clinical and dietetics department at the Royal Hospital in Oman. She is the senior clinical dietitian uh, and holds a bachelor's and master's degree in human nutrition and dietetics from Sultan Qaboos University. She is also a certified neurological ketonic diet specialist and completed her training at John Hopkins Uni Hospital in the US. She holds a diploma in pediatric nutrition from Boston University and holds another diploma in six Sigma and Lean Management for Healthcare. She has participated in many local nutrition projects and currently works on the National Nutrition Guidelines. She's also interested in empowering women in healthcare leadership. I'm sure her speech will be very interesting this morning. Okay, good morning, Dubai. Thank you, Ms. Mona and your team for inviting me today. So I don't have a lot of time. I might go quickly, but uh, just I want to give you a request. You have a bottle of waters in front of you. By the end of my lecture, I want to see half of it gone. Okay, so drink water, hydrate your bodies. So today I'm going to be talking about one of the most uh, vital organs in our body, which are the kidneys. When I started working 15 years ago, the first thing I told my HOD is that I don't want to work in kidney because, um, you know, I was scared when I was a student. Critical care areas and kidneys were areas I don't want to work in. But alhamdulillah, now I'm mastering it, I hope so. How do we operate this? Okay. So today we'll be talking about some uh, definitions, uh, what's the situation in Oman. Uh, the most important thing I'm going to highlight is about malnutrition in CKD. And of course, we will review the latest guidelines that was published by the KDO, QI, and the uh, Academy of Nutrition, uh, American Nutrition. So if you don't work with uh, nephrology patients, I think there's one slide missing. Anyway, uh, chronic kidney disease is characterized by an irreversible damage in the kidney functions, and there will be a reduction in the glomerular filtration rates. That is the rate where your blood, uh, blood gets uh, filtered. And um, unfortunately, it leads to an end stage where renal replacement therapy is necessary for a long-term survival. So it starts with stage one. You still have a pretty much effective kidney function. It's 90% and higher, but it starts proceeding to stage five where the kidney functions is less than 15%. Uh, so here you're going to need um, dialysis, hemo, peritoneal, or even transplantation, as I said, for a long-term survival. Unfortunately, it's pretty much common. We consider it a non-communicable disorder. And why do we care that much as clinical dietitians? I'm just talking from a nutritional point of view, the role of your kidneys. So it's important to regulate your blood pressure, remove toxins. Um, it's important in your bone stability. It activates the vitamin D. It's important to balance the fluids, the water, and as well, acid-base balance, hormones, enzymes. Think of the glucose homeostasis. You need your kidneys to degrade the insulin. You need your kidneys to excrete extra glucose and reabsorb glucose if needed. But the most important thing we tend to forget is the role of kidneys in um, producing the EPO, which is the erythropoietin. This is a glycoprotein that is responsible to produce red blood cells. So if you have a damage to your kidneys, um, you will have an acid retention leading to metabolic disorders, leading therefore to metabolic derangements. You will have uh, anemia, high rates of uremia that can cause a lot of malnutrition. You can have bone mineral disorders, so um, insulin resistance. If the fluids are not balanced, you end up with overhydration or dehydration. And of course, both have been linked to uh, negative side effects. So what are the risk factors of chronic kidney disease? As any non-communicable -commun disorder, um, you will see diabetes, you will see blood pressures, uh, cardiovascular disease as a risk factor, family history, especially in pediatric ages, 
smoking and tobacco is no longer associated with lung cancers. That's the myth. It's only causing cancer. But no, studies are now showing it can cause chronic kidney diseases. Age, obviously, but the superstar is obesity. So uh, we had a previous session talking about obesity, even COVID-19. By the way, congratulations, it's not anymore a pandemic. But the obese patients did not skip it. They were resistant to uh, vaccines. They had the highest mortality rate. So um, obesity, unfortunately, we still are not controlling it in, in this region. What is the current situation in Oman? So if you don't know Oman, it's, uh, we're just a sister country neighboring the UAE. We have now a population approaching 5 million. That's exciting. Um, the rate in Oman, um, we have a gap in publications of the prevalences, but according to our data, it was about 21 per million population in 1998. It jumped to 120 per million population. And unfortunately, this increase was associated with a higher mortality and morbidity rates. Of course, today with the rate of obesity in Oman increasing, so I, I know the rate of chronic kidney disease is also going higher. So the situation in Oman, it's more prevalent in males, 57% uh, than females, 43%. And the median age was around 53 years. How is it here in the region, in Saudi and Dubai? Is it pretty much the same? Okay, I think we should be the same because, I mean, given the genetics and the culture. Uh, top three leading causes of uh, chronic kidney disease in Oman, it starts with diabetic nephropathy, leading still hypertensive nephropathy. The genetic disorders caused only 5% of our uh, chronic kidney disease population. So the most important part I'm excited to talk about today is the malnutrition in chronic kidney disease. Unfortunately, it is underdetected. It's sometimes neglected. Um, before we talk about malnutrition, let's see what are the factors that exacerbate malnutrition in chronic kidney disease patients. Many reasons, but just to summarize it, one could be the conflicting and confusing information out there. Um, we, we lack our regional national guidelines. We're adapting international guidelines without considering the, the culture and the habits. So that can be really um, uh, confusing. We don't have unified practices. A patient will see me in my hospital, go to another hospital with different information. Number two, some hospitals don't have specialized clinical dietitians in the area of uh, nephrology. And that will lead to an excessive dietary um, uh, restriction. Google, our patients rely now. Now we have ChatGBT coming on board. So all this information can really be confusing. Sometimes it's caused by the disease itself. We know as like, for example, cancer. In chronic kidney disease, you've got a hypercatabolic status. Um, inflammation is very high, so it leads to inadequate uh, intake. The most important thing we fear as clinical dietitians is have a patient reaching to this stage, which is protein energy wasting. So just to define it in a very simple way, think of what happens in cancer cachexia. In protein energy wasting, uh, this is a slide adopted by one of the top researchers in kidney disease, Dr. Carrero. Uh, he defines it as a, a status where it's driven by two uh, parameters. The first is undernutrition, and the second is hypercatabolism. So when we treat protein energy wasting, they look separate, but they're actually interlinked components. Protein energy wasting can occur across the whole spectrum of chronic kidney disease. So it's a myth when they say it only occurs, you know, at stage four and stage five. You can have chronic kidney disease starting, the, the protein energy wasting starting from stage one. And to support what I'm saying, there are a lot of data, but I've selected some of the uh, interesting uh, papers. For example, if you have a patient who is not on dialysis, the prevalence rate can go up to 54%. The dialysis category as well have higher rates, more than 50%. This was a study done on 98 countries uh, with uh, around 1,600 patients on dialysis, showing that the prevalence can go high. We also have the transplant category. The evidence is less, but according to whatever has been published, the protein energy wasting can be up to 52%. So, and maybe because in transplant, the priority for a medical team is to, you know, 
put the patient on immunosuppressants, let's save the kidney, put him on a neutropenic diet, forgetting that those patients can undergo some protein energy wasting. And for these reasons, the medical nutrition therapy should focus on two strategies. The first strategy is to delay and stop the progress of the disease. And this is by focusing on the core components of the kidney diet, which is having adequate calories, adequate proteins, um, and of course, a, a suitable amount of electrolytes. The second strategy is to prevent and minimize any nutritional side effects, like for example, preventing and reversing uremia side effects, preventing and reversing protein energy wasting. If I'm going fast, just stop me, okay? Here, uh, before we proceed, I thought uh, it would be interesting to show you what's the historical perspective about kidney diseases and the diet back in the old age. I tried to draw it in a nice way so it can become easy. So you, you're gonna hear a lot of diets called milk diets in the 1800s. It used to be helpful with uh, chronic kidney disease patients, but the most important one was the Kepner rice diet. This was based on a 2000 calorie rice, fruits, and sugar, and it really, really helped the patients back then. But you can see it wasn't until the 70s and 80s we had a better understanding of the disease progress, the uh, medical nutrition therapy guidelines started to evolve, but the game changer was the, product, the introduction of phosphate binders. I think that changed everything. Phosphate binders, potassium scavengers. But today, um, if you have attended the ISPIN and the ASPIN, you know that um, nutrition now is human right. It was declared that nutrition is human right. So these guidelines will support uh, that every patient with CKD should be referred to a dietitian as soon as possible. Don't wait until your patient you know, starts dialysis or is going for transplant. You know you have a patient diagnosed, send him as soon as possible. This infographic over here would probably be the best visual representation to what I'm about to say in a very easy way. Kidney disease is about, we said it's five stages. Your dietitian will really be helpful in all the stages. The first two stages over here, it's about lifestyle modification. So the dietitian will help the patient control diabetes, uh, control the weight, control blood pressure, making sure the patient is taking a good quality diet. As we move along the spectrum, we enter the stage three. Here you will start seeing some early symptoms developing, anemia, edema, some bone diseases. So here, at this stage, the diet will slightly change. You will see us playing with the ratios of the um, electrolytes, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, probably even fluid. But at the same time, we are maintaining a lifestyle modification or a healthy lifestyle. Stage four and five, that's purely about symptom control. So it's going to be purely a renal diet, and we will work if, you know, individualizing treatment. If your patient is having constipation, any inflammation, any anemia, we treat it as well. So see, the dietitian is important in every stage of chronic kidney disease. So if we have a doctor available here today, please refer to your clinical dietitian as soon as possible. So today we will be covering a little bit about the latest guidelines uh, that was published by the National Kidney Foundation in USA. This was a joint committee collaboration uh, with the American Academy of Nutrition. Do you know when was the last guidelines published? That was two decades ago. So imagine within 20 years, the amount of data, the amount of research, the amount of evidence out there, um, it's about time that they came up with this national guideline. And I always recommend as a GCC country, we have our own unified practices as well. So I will highlight just some uh, points I wanted to focus on, which is the kilocal, the protein, uh, and some of the electrolytes and fluid balances. Remember, we are going towards uh, patient-centered care. You're gonna hear this a lot in hospitals client-centered care. So we go, um, Ms. Farah was saying, a personalized uh, approach. Uh, remember, your patient has different backgrounds, different bodies, different cultures, different religions. So we need to take different eating habits. We need to take all that in consideration before giving them a meal plan saying, eat broccoli 24 hours a day, okay? 
We don't eat broccoli. I don't eat broccoli. I hate broccoli. So, uh, okay, something's wrong with my slides. Anyway, this is the general uh, perception we know about renal disease when we, you know, graduate from university. Before dialysis, we have restricted proteins, restricted electrolytes. After dialysis or with the transplantation, protein requirements will go higher, uh, caloric requirements might go higher, maybe some moderate restriction in electrolytes, maybe no restriction at all. But let's see how it changed uh, now in the guidelines. So as I said, um, this was the joint committee who did the guidelines. The first section, they talked about nutrition screening or nutrition and nutrition assessment. So the guidelines refer to using subjective global assessment, mass screening tools, malnutrition inflammation scores. But I found recently there is a, a specific screening tool for renal patients called renal INET. Renal INET, I, I don't know how it's pronounced. Anyway, I downloaded it and I used it with five patients. And it's really good. It's easy, it's effective, it's straightforward. I don't know if anyone here is working with this or tried it before. If not, download it and, um, and, and try using it. Pilot it with some patients and see it's really, really useful. Um, I can email you the, the, the information if you want. For the energy requirements, you will find in a very quick way, straightforward, the guidelines we're mentioning, uh, 25 kilocal to 30, uh, 35 kilocal per kg per day. But please remember, take into consideration age, gender, physical activity, presence of any other, you know, illness, uh, any inflammation is there. These numbers might go higher or lower. If you don't want to use that, uh, that straightforward uh, method, um, we always know indirect calorimetries are the standard. How many of you have an indirect calorimetry? in their practice. Okay, I might apply and work with you, okay? You are lucky, you are lucky. Indirect calorimetries probably are mostly used for research because they're very expensive. Um, they're not, uh, you know, um, not practical for a hospital to get. But if you have it, please use it. Uh, it's amazing, it's really accurate. If you don't have it, don't be afraid to use predictive equation energy, uh, uh, you know, equations. Uh, they do come with high accuracy rates. So whatever your hospital policy, whatever you feel comfortable using, just go ahead with it. Put in mind some equations, as I think one of the sessions yesterday were highlighting, it might um, you know, overestimate or underestimate some energy needs. So you need to use a lot of clinical judgment. When it came to the protein requirements, Back in the old days, we know before dialysis, you can put a patient on 0.8 gram per kg per day as a normal person. It can go a little bit lower. But according to the uh, guidelines, if your patient is, on, is not on dialysis and has no diabetes, it can go up to 0.6 gram per kg per day. But the most important thing, they acknowledge the use of keto analogs. Does anyone here use keto analogs in their practices? If you use a keto analogs, I know one dietitian here wants to start using it in, in Ras al Khaimah. Uh, we will start. We have already collaborated with Frizzini and Scabby to supply us with the keto analogs. If you use them, you have to put your patient on a very low protein, uh, up to 0.4 gram per kg per day. Studies have shown keto analogs can reduce the progress of the kidney disease in stage three and four. They can improve survival. They can reduce the need of dialysis. So you can read. Uh, there are many publications. If anyone is interested, talk to me in the break time. I can email it to you or talk to Ferzini and Scabby. They can come and do a presentation in your uh, clinics. Now, still the guidelines will say that higher proteins up to 1.2 gram per kg per day will be needed for the patients who are on dialysis. Now, I compared it to the New Zealand and the um, the Australian guidelines, and I found that it's pretty much similar. However, pre-dialysis, they can go up to 0.9 gram per kg per day, of course, depending on the case, but they can go up to 0.9 gram per kg per day. Now, if you're a dietitian who works in a critical care area, there is a great publication by ISPIN in 2021, I think, uh, about the hospitalized patients with uh, acute and chronic kidney diseases. So, have a look, you will find a 
amazing evidence. Um, if you have a question about do I use ideal body weight, uh, current body weight, it's self-explanatory. The rationals are amazing. So have a look at this uh, study if you have time. Anyway, moving forward, the protein type. This was something I was waiting for a long time for this evidence to come out. You no longer need to select a certain protein over another. Is animal proteins good or plant-based proteins good? Still, we don't have any suggestive or conclusive data to pick a particular one over another. So if your patient is vegetarian, support that patient. As a clinical dietitian, make sure he can cover all the essential amino acids needed. If your patient loves to eat meat, let's, let's work with it and just give the advices needed. Uh, here are some studies to support what I, uh, I, I said now. Uh, you will find no significant difference in both groups when it comes to albumin and pre-albumin level, no significant difference in anti-inflammation markers like alpha TNFs, no significant difference in the serum and urinary uh, amounts of uh, electrolytes, sodium, phosphate, calcium, and no significant difference even in lipid profile. So that is exciting and that's really um, uh, nice information. How about the sodium? And the sodium is the silent killer. The guidelines refer to use less than 2.3 grams per day. Some uh, practices in the United States and NHS are going for less than 1.5, which I totally support. And I got curious to see what's the situation in Oman. So we found out there was a study published in, in 2017 called the Survey uh, Step Study. This is average people, huh? not uh, chronic kidney disease people. It shows that it was around 8.5 grams per day. So imagine me telling a patient coming to me, an Omani patient, no, we need to go less than 2.3 grams per day. It was higher in men. Uh, I don't want to say I'm happy because we are always higher in everything. Female are higher in obesity. We're higher, probably death rates. Gray hairs are higher in, in female. So, so yeah, they get now the, the high sodium. It's lower in females, well done. And um, uh, I think uh, the, the numbers change now in Oman. I'm, I tried to get the newest updated pre, uh, you know, prevalence in intake, but I couldn't find it. But because the obesity rate increased, so I assume the salt intake as well is increasing. Although, although the government is doing its best in promoting and doing awareness to reduce salt intake. Anyway, as a clinical dietitian, I always ask my team to teach every patient coming to our clinic how to read labels, any patient coming to our clinic. Now, thank God, sodium is mandatory to be listed. The easy way I tell my patients, if you go to the ingredient list at the, uh, the lower bottom, if salt and its generic names are mentioned in the top five, just don't take that product. It's probably very high and not good. There are now other technologies you can download in your Android phones and your iPhones. Um, it's like a program where it scans the barcodes of product and it will show you if this product is good or not. So you can you know, take advantage, whatever program is there. Most of them are free, by the way. You can try it and see if, but that will work only if your products are registered. And I think yesterday someone from Sahri I think Nof, her name, was mentioning that these products are now registered. When it comes to the potassium, unfortunately, we all love potassium because uh, it's presented in most of the amazing foods we love. In Oman, we have an issue. Children love bananas. Our elderly patients love dates. So if you tell an elder patient, please go slow with the dates, they will say, nope, you're crossing the line. Dates is a big no. So... Uh, what did the guidelines mention about potassium? Very simply, they said any adjustment to the dietary potassium should maintain only serum potassium levels. So if your patient comes to you with a normal serum level, it's fine, we can continue the same management. If you need to add a supplemental potassium, if you need to add a potassium scavenger, that depends on your patient situation, uh, the disease status, and of course, clinical judgment. You hear me saying clinical judgment again. And this is the argue I had with Dr. Muna Hashim yes yesterday. We need to teach our dietitians how to take effective clinical decisions. Um, 
Potassium is not mandatory to be listed on, uh, unfortunately, nutrition labels. Uh, I hope in the coming future we see our governments forcing uh, that potassium should be on it. But if it is presented as well, we teach our patients how to read it, what's a high potassium product, what's a low potassium product, and what is a normal potassium product. Phosphorus, again, our pediatric patients love it um, because it's presented in dairy products. Our babies drink a lot of milk in Oman, yet they're very skinny. I don't know why, but they love milk. They love cheese. They love laban, our pediatric patients. Our adults, um, not that much, but they may be more into the laban side. Anyway, the, the, the guidelines were similar to the potassium, so you only make changes to maintain the serum uh, phosphate levels. And again, you need a lot of clinical judgment whenever you take an evidence. And again, we teach them how to read the food labels of the uh, phosphorus. Remember, when you teach a patient how to read the food level, uh, label, give them all the generic names. So phosphor will not be written as phosphorus. There are other names, so it's good if you can give them a list. What are the names that can, you know, probably mean phosphorus in the food label? The last point, which is the dietary patterns. Now, myself, I don't like to rely on a certain dietary pattern, but if you feel you want to try a certain dietary pattern, use the Mediterranean, use the DASH diets. However, some patients will come to our clinic asking for detox diets. Please, whenever they mention the word detox, just end the conversation. There's no science to back it up, so no need to proceed talking about it. Intermittent fasting, if your patient is having diabetes as well as chronic kidney disease, that can be a problem. Fasting can be a problem for them, so I really don't recommend it. Ketogenic diets, studies are done on rats and mice, showing good, you know, uh, promising evidence, but again, you're providing a patient with a high protein diet. Already the kidney cannot handle higher proteins. So please stay away of it for now and don't try it with, uh, with a chronic kidney disease patient. So as I said, if you have to, just uh, the Mediterranean still shows great, um, great uh, success. So these are the take home messages. I want to say, these are them, but I want to say something else. Screen, screen, screen your patients for malnutrition. Two, let's advocate for now organ transplantation. Remember, we can survive with one kidney. So please get the message out there. We have now a new committee of organ transplant in Oman, and we really wish to see the public awareness on organ transplantation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, from Oman. Before we come back to Dubai, I would like to thank all our attendees, whether locally or international, uh, especially our very supportive um, uh, society from Malaysia and Dohad, Professor Hamad Jan, who couldn't be with us. Uh, he might join us virtually sometime during this day. I just would like to say welcome and thank you for your ongoing support. Back to Dubai, our second speaker for today, Ms. Samia Athamna, Senior Clinical Dietitian at Dubai Hospital. Um, she has obtained her bachelor's degree from nutrition and food technology in, from Jordan University of Science and Technology in Jordan. She has started as a clinical dietitian since 2005 to 2008 in Zahra Private Hospital and is currently joined as a senior dietitian in Dubai Hospital till date. Um, she is also the member of the Liver Transplant Committee in Dubai Hospital and the member of the Quality Committee as a quality coordinator. Thank you for joining us today. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure today to share with you the latest update in the uh, renal nutritional practice that is used in UAE. It's a continuation to what Ms. Sana have been presented already. We just wanted to show that the renal nutritional practice it, uh, in UAE is always uh, similar to the Gulf country. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Riyad Shakir. Uh, he is the dean of my college 20 years back in Jordan. It's really nice to see you after a long time. 
This is the agenda of my presentation. Uh, I would like to talk about the two types of kidney disease, then definition and classifications and the staging system. The most important part will be about the nutritional assessment, nutritional recommendation, and some part for the patient education for the families and for uh, caregivers. And finally, summary and take home message. Okay, actually in renal disease, we need to know that there is two types of uh, renal uh, disease, acute kidney disease, which is recently known as acute kidney injury and the chronic kidney disease. Uh, acute kidney uh, uh, injury actually uh, has been referred to acute kidney injury recently in the latest update. And it is uh, defined as uh, abrupt and sustained reduction in the kidney function due to a severe kidney function decline. It can be a result from illness, surgery, or severe trauma. This condition is usually uh, reversible and treatable if it is diagnosed early and detected early. Uh, if left untreated, it might cause severe chronic kidney disease. The classification and the staging of acute kidney disease based on serum creatinine and the duration of oliguria. Usually in the hospital practice, we receive many referral of the patient. Uh, they call the renal patient just because the elevation of creatinine. Here we need to clarify that not any elevation of creatinine is considered as renal and need to be treated as renal patient. Lots of parameters should be connected together in, uh, in order to confirm uh, renal happiness. There is two classification of acute uh, kidney injury available, and actually this tool is uh, important and uh, widely used. Uh, there is a refill. Uh, actually, uh, it is referred to risk injury, failure, loss, and in the stage renal disease. And again, in our current practice in UAE, we are using refill, so I'll be talking about in details about this classification. They classify the uh, illness and the progressing of the disease into five main stages. Stage one, when the serum creatinine is doubled by 1.5 and there is decrease in the GFR to more than 25%. Along with that, there is decrease in the urine output to less than 0.5 millimeter per kg per hours in the duration of six hours. And so on, till we reach the stage five, which is usually lasts for more than three months. The important part about the nutritional assessment, uh, Dr. Sana have uh, raised one important point about the nutritional assessment for renal patient. Uh, luckily, in Dubai Hospital and Dubai Health Authority, we have a standard protocol for assessing renal patients that they are seeing without referral. We don't want uh, the doctor's referral in order to access the patient and assess the patient. All kidney patients are considered as high risk and uh, seen immediately. The nutrition assessment for acute kidney injury is always uh, the same for normal individual. Of course, there are small changes can be done in the nutrition assessment. There is no uh, dietary regimen that can be used for all patients. Uh, and we follow the ABCD approach, which is the A stand for anthropometric, B for biochemistry, C for clinical, and D for the dietary assessment. In this slide, uh, uh, we can see the nutritional recommendation for acute kidney injury, uh, the micronutrients di distribution for the protein. If patient is conservative management, uh, not yet on dialysis, we give 0.6 to 1.0 gram protein per kg per day. And we advocate the patient to have 50% at least of animal sources, which is high biological value. If the patient is started on renal replacement therapy at initiation of hemodialysis, uh, the needs and the demands for the protein will be more, 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kg per day. For patient on continuous renal replacement therapy, especially CVV, HD, uh, demands also will be even higher. 1.7 gram per kg per day, hypercatabolic, critically ill patient, uh, more 1.7 to 2 gram per kg per day. The energy, usually there is no energy expenditure uh, needed for renal patients, so the resting energy expenditure and the quick equation can be used 20 to 30 kilocalorie per kg per day for both types of uh, disease. Fat, 30 to 35% uh, of total kilocalories required for the patient, and the carbohydrate is 50 to 60% for both. Uh, sodium should be restricted, uh, especially on the conservative management, unless there is diuretic use. So uh, always check for the medication in the medication chart for the patient and check for the uh, potassium level. Usually we give it 
two to three gram uh, for both. Uh, of course, the need uh, for potassium will be more if the patient is in hemodialysis. Uh, fluid uh, in the conservative uh, non-dialysis patient, uh, 500 to 750 ml plus the urine output. And for hemodialysis, uh, 750 ml plus urine output. And if the patient on CVVHD, again, it will be more liberalized to uh, one, more than 1,000 ml per day. Potassium also should be restricted to 2 to 3 gram for both, and uh, needs also might increase with uh, dialysis. Phosphate, 10 to 15 gram uh, for conservative non-dialysis patient, and for hemodialysis patient, the need for phosphate binder is a must. How to apply our nutrition practice to a real scenario, patient scenario? Actually, appropriate renal diet should be based on the modality of the treatment as mentioned in the previous slide, patient tolerance, fluid restriction, biochemistry, body uh, anthropometric measurement, waist circumference, and so on. If the patient is having poor intake, and this is very common uh, symptoms for the patient due to uremic symptoms, due to fatigue, uh, due to depression because of the disease itself, then we might uh, suggest a nutritional supplement Supplementation. If again we failed in the nutritional supplementation, which is which should be a renal designed uh, uh, supplement, then we can combine uh, enteral feeding. Uh, again, we can use appetite stimulant. Uh, diet liberalization can be there, and we might ask the patient about the food preferences avergence in order to put it in our meal planning. For a critically ill patient, enteral feeding is a challenge, especially with uh, lots of oedema, uh, which uh, uh, prevent the absorption of certain nutrients in the gut. Uh, if this is also not achieved, uh, again, we can consider TBM. It's not a single decision, actually. Multidisciplinary team is preferable. The second type of this disease is the chronic kidney disease. The uh, meaning of a chronic it's, uh, means that it is irreversible and it is a lifelong. Uh, in this part, actually, we will be talking about the renal replacement therapy, including the renal transplant. Again, there is a classification of this disease into two, five major categories based on the GFR, the filtration rate, uh, class one or stage one, when the filtration rate is more than 90, this is considered normal, and it gets decreased till we reach stage five when the GFR is less than 15. Here, there is, uh, it's called kidney failure, and the need for dialysis is a must for other renal replacement therapy. When planning a renal diet, the most important nutrients need to be taken in consideration is the protein, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, fluids, and fat. The goal of medical nutrition therapy to slow the progression of renal failure, to support the visceral fat protein, prevent the protein from being degenerated and used for gluconeogenesis, to maintain life of the kidney till we got another uh, kidney from any donor, and to prevent malnutrition for the patient, especially for critically ill patient. Again, the nutrition assessment for chronic kidney disease is the same for any normal individual with some modifications. We follow again the ABCD approach. What do we mean by the ABCD approach? It stands for anthropometric, where we assess the weight, and the difference here we assess the, the dry weight for dialysis patient. And uh, we adjust, uh, we also look for the oedema free body water, adjusted body water, especially if the patient is severely underweight or severely morbid obese. Uh, if weight is normal, uh, we can use the actual body weight. And the recent study uh, stated that a higher body mass of 25 to 85 has been shown to give uh, a better, higher uh, survival rate. Malnutrition, also mentioned by my colleague, it's very important. We have different tools, and it's already applied in our documentation in DHA. This is the most important lab that has to be in screen uh, before assessing the patient, the serum sodium. Uh, and uh, this is the normal range. It has to be 136 to 145. Uh, sodium balance and sodium control is very important to control the fluid and the blood pressure control. Keeping potassium also uh, normal between 4 to 5.5. Any abnormal in the potassium level, either hyperkalemia or hypokalemia, may lead uh, to cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrest. 
Uh, albumin, it's also a very important factor in assessing and intervening with uh, dialysis or uh, renal patient. Uh, the normal range is 3.5 to, uh, 3 to 5.2 milligram per deciliter, and it's very important for detecting protein, energy, malnutrition, and the fluid balance as well. Serum phosphate, again, it should be normal. Any abnormal in the phosphate, it might lead to uh, soft tissue calcification and bone disease. Same also applied for calcium. C, uh, we said A, B, C, D, so I, anthropometric we have done B, biochemistry. C is uh, referred to as uh, the clinical. In the clinical, we usually assess the fluid overloading, which is uh, usually reflected by oedema, shortness of breath, leg and face uh, swelling, and the need for oxygen. We assess also the uremic symptoms because of uh, urea elevation, and that is reflected by nausea, vomiting, anorexia, fatigue, fainting, insomnia, and bad smelling of the breath. Uh, the potassium symptoms, uh, actually, if the patient is having hyperkalemia, he will develop hyper, uh, heart palpitations. If hypokalemic, he will be fainted, and that might lead to heart attack later on if kept not uh, untreated. The phosphate symptoms, usually, it is itching, red eyes, uh, body pain, brittle bones, artery calcification, and nausea bleeds. D stands for dietary history. We have different uh, uh, models uh, to use for assessing the patient dietary intake. We can use the 24 dietary call. We can use the food diary. This is uh, actually uh, helpful in pediatric. Uh, we can use the food frequency, uh, frequency questionnaire, or we can use the food exchange list. Any of them can do the same uh, result. The most important part, again, in the nutritional recommendation for CKD, CKD patient is knowing the macro and micronutrients recommendation. Again, we have uh, three categories, conservative uh, patients who are not yet on any treatment. We have hemodialysis patient, peritoneal, and trans transplant. The protein requirement for conservative and dialysis patient, it can be started from 0.6 to 0.75 uh, gram. In stages 1 to 3, it might be a little bit more 0.75 gram. Stages 4 to 5, we restrict it a, bit, a little bit, 0.6 to 0.7 uh, gram per kg per day. Again, we emphasize that 50% of this protein should, can, should come from the animal sources. If the patient is started on hemodialysis, uh, the needs for the protein will be more, 1.2 gram per kg per day. Peritoneal dialysis, since it's a daily procedure, more protein will be lost uh, through the dialysis machine, so protein requirement will be definitely more, 1.2 to 1.3 gram per kg. The transplant, actually, I have a separate session for the transplant, so I will not uh, go in details. Initially, in the first stage, 1.3 to 2 gram per day, and in the maintenance, it is 0.8 to 1 gram per kg per day. The energy, actually, energy level will be the same with all patients' category, 30 to 35 gram per kg per day. And remember to use the weight based on the body mass index and the uh, waist circumference. Carbohydrate, 50 to 60 percent from the total energy intake and fat 25 to 30% with all patients category as well. This is the micronutrient recommendations for CKD. Fiber is very important to improve and boost the gut microflora. We give 20 to 30 gram per kg per day for all uh, patients category. A fluid is varied actually for conservative non-dialysis patient, usually unrestricted, especially if the patient is uh, having uh, normal urine output. If patient is on dialysis, we give 500 to 750 ml. Peritoneal dialysis, more, 1,500 uh, uh, to 2,000 milli per day. And for the transplant, especially on uh, six weeks after the transplant, there is no limitation and there is no restrictions. Uh, sodium, it is individualized for non-dialysis patient, 1,000 to 1,400. Uh, patient uh, with hemodialysis, uh, 2,000 to 400 uh, milligram per day. Same for peritoneal dialysis and the transplant. Calcium, uh, less than 2,000 milligram per day. Same for all uh, except for the transplant, it is a bit less, 1,200 to 1,500 milligram per day. And finally, phosphorus, 800 to 1,000 for all the uh, stages of this disease, except for the transplant on the long, long run, there is no limitations. 
how to apply this practice in our daily nutrition intervention. Uh, preventing a protein energy malnutrition is very important because it's found to be a risk factor for other complications, especially mortality and morbidity. A preserve optimal nutritional status in CKD is a must. Again, if the patient is having poor oral intake, body mass index is very low, less than 18. If the patient have experienced weight loss more than 10% in the past few weeks, then start supplementation as soon as possible. This supplementation aids in adding 10 to 15 kilocalorie per kg per day for the patient with 0.3 to 0.4 gram per kg per day from the protein. Uh, uh, please try to use the renal standard formula. There is uh, actually uh, different formulas available in the market, but uh, specific disease uh, formula, especially for the renal, is a must because it's controlled the fluid intake electrolytes intake and it is should be also valid for a normal low and high protein intake again if supplementation is not working then we can combine with enteral feeding critically ill patient enteral feeding due to bowel movement again it is a challenging so we can make multidisciplinary team and uh, talk with the doctors if not achieved then consider tbm Patient education, here is some extra points that the patients or the family need to be uh, understanding because uh, when we are talking about numbers, actually, maybe healthcare provider interesting in knowing numbers, but patient, you know, they are not having enough uh, literature about the nutrition to deal with number. So we give them some more tips about and how to achieve their nutrition requirements, especially for energy requirements. Here, uh, some guidelines to enhance or maintain energy intake. People who are having low intake or poor appetite, we might advise them to have a more complex carbohydrate or more simple carbohydrate, especially if there is good control on uh, blood sugar, just to boost the energy intake. Uh, examples, uh, for example, jam sweets, clear boiled sweets, marshmallow, jelly beans, peppermint, and so on. Uh, energy density food can be, for example, uh, we can uh, explain to the patients or the family to add butter or margarine to their uh, fluids or to their uh, soft foods in order to enrich the food with the nutrients. Uh, better to uh, advise them also on bully unsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acid to prevent uh, further complication of hypertriglyceridemia. Again, if it is not sufficient, we might uh, recommend oral nutritional supplementation. For the protein requirement, as we all know, there is restriction for the protein if the patient is not yet on dialysis. 50% should be high biological value from the animal sources. And again, if the patient is vegetarian, as Dr. Sana mentioned, we cannot uh, force him to uh, select the food from uh, a food aversion that he doesn't like. Balance between the uh, food groups is very important. More uh, requirement will be if the patient is on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. If again, patient is unable to achieve his protein requirement from diet, there is a wide range of supplementation, which is modular type, that is either powder or bars or cookies. It's a protein, pure protein. So it can be helpful in achieving and the protein, improving protein status. Uh, some guidelines for sodium restriction to avoid the processed food, avoiding adding salt to the food. Salt replacement is not recommended because usually it's high in potassium and may lead to further complications. Flavoring is allowed. Different flavors can be used as a seasoning like garlic, onion, chili, curry powder, and so on. For the fluid restriction, uh, we uh, need to educate the patient that this kind of food considered as a fluid called the drinks, coffee, tea, ice cream. We uh, might tell them also to distribute the fluid even though throughout the day to suck on ice cubes because it takes long time in the mouth, to use the sweets within allowances, freeze liquids, uh, add lemon juice uh, to uh, water to make it more refreshing. For the potassium restriction, individualized fruits and vegetables, because this is the major group uh, which is high in potassium, patients should be educated to use the uh, food group which is low in potassium. There are different uh, groups, high, moderate, low, moderate and low can be used freely. Cooking method also should be also educated for the patient. 
The last part is about the transplant. For the transplant patient, uh, we started uh, three years back the organ transplantation, kidney transplantation in Dubai Hospital, and we start educating the patients on this reference. Uh, we divided the uh, nutritional guidelines for two uh, stages, the immediate post-transplant, which is immediately after the surgery. We should give high-calorie, high-protein uh, diet because uh, we need to uh, promote wound healing and to promote visceral protein stores. Hospital diet with a snack or a nutritional supplementation also should be there. Fluid restriction till the kidneys start functioning. Potassium should be restricted, especially in the first seven days of the operation. Symptoms like diarrhea, constipation should be assessed also and managed. And we should also educate the patients about the food safety and hygiene. The second stage, which is uh, six weeks after the transplant, actually now we need to know that patients taking corticosteroids, so they are at risk of developing obesity, high blood pressure. So healthy dietary lifestyle, which is low in fat, low in sugar, high in fiber, restrict salt, no more limitations for the fluid and phosphate in this stage. And we should monitor electrolytes very regularly on monthly basis and uh, nutrition full up in the clinic again on monthly basis. And patients should exercise regularly. The take-home message is, as we have mentioned many times, practices should be very among the hospital. Please update any protocols that allow you to see the patient without referral. Do not wait till the patient end up with malnutrition. Maybe uh, by that time, even nutrition assessment will not make a big difference. Renal diet is individualized, and effort should be always, you know, focused on healthy uh, uh, management and healthy and luckily in Dubai Hospital, we have also a special section for activity and awareness in different organizations and in different places to prevent the disease occurrence. By this, I'm just closing my presentation and thank you again for your kind attention. Thank you, Ms. Sami, for that very interesting presentation. Our next speaker for this final session Dr. Salwa Suwedi, who will be speaking about the updates in Alzheimer's and MCI and the role of nutrition. I think you can introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, I hope they have my slides. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you are still awake. My name is Dr. Salwa Suwedi. Uh, I'm a consultant in internal medicine and geriatric medicine and director of Seniors Happiness Center. Uh, in Dubai Academic Health Corporation, which is a, uh, I mean, a long-term care facility for inpatients and uh, an outpatient department for the outpatient. Uh, my talk this morning is different. Uh, I hope you are interested to hear something about Alzheimer. But before starting, uh, may I know if anyone came across a patient with Alzheimer or, or different type of dementia? Anyone? Only two. Okay. <laughs> okay. What is the next? What is the next? Okay. So uh, today I'll be uh, I'll be defining dementia because uh, it seems that not uh, so many were uh, actually involved or uh, came across a patient with dementia. Uh, we'll talk about the different types of dementia, what happens to the brain uh, of Alzheimer, what are the signs and symptoms of dementia, what are the risk factors, how to investigate, uh, what's the management available so far, and how can we prevent, and then I'll touch upon the role of nutrition. So, <clears throat> dementia is a neurodegenerative disorder. So, when I say neuro, so it's affecting the central nervous system, Degenerative, it means that it's happening with aging. So I don't expect dementia in a, in a, in a, in a uh, for example, a, very, uh, a young person. Uh, dementia would interfere with daily functioning, and you will come across this later. It's a syndrome which is usually chronic and progressive, in which there is deterioration in different cognitive domains or different cognitive functions that would be far more beyond uh, uh, the, the expected deterioration which happens with normal aging. Uh, dementia would affect multiple cognitive domains, not only memory, because so many patients think that dementia is only memory. It's not only memory. It would affect the way how we think, the orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning capacity, language, and judgment. 
The impairment of cognitive function is commonly accompanied by and occasionally preceded by changes in mood. Usually the patients are depressed before getting dementia. And dementia would not affect the level of consciousness. Going and speaking a little bit about the history, the doctor in the picture is Alois Alzheimer. He's a German, he was a German uh, psychiatrist and neuropathologist. And the lady on the, la on the right side is uh, Auguste Dieter. He had described the first case of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease in 1906. This was his patient. He was following her case for five years. The lady complained of, or the family brought her actually to him and she was having problems with memory. Uh, language, uh, she was having unpredictable behavior, morbid jealousy uh, toward her husband. She was leaving the house, unable to go back. She started forgetting names. And he had, and he was not, uh, he did not come across such a case before. So he was following this lady for around five years, from 1901 until 1906, when she died. And then he asked a permission from her family to do a brain autopsy to find out what's wrong with her brain. And <clears throat> so after following her for five years, she died, she passed away at the age of 51, and he examined her brain. And this is what was found. Okay. Uh, this is what he found. He found plugs and tangles, which are certain protein that was deposited inside the neurons and uh, between the neurons. And here we are comparing the healthy neuron. You can see a healthy neuron communicating with another neuron and nothing in between obstructing this. And this is what he found, unhealthy neurons which, uh, with, with uh, a toxic protein that is inside and unhealthy uh, connection between the neurons because of another protein, toxic protein that is deposited between the cells. So, and this is what, what, uh, what is called the plugs and tangles, and it was named, so the disease was named uh, by the name of the scientist, uh, Alzheimer, and this is the, the pathological hallmark of Alzheimer that we know uh, currently. So when we say the title was MCI versus dementia uh, versus Alzheimer, what's the difference? Uh, MCI is mild cognitive impairment. I, I come across a, a lot of patients with MCI. I wouldn't call them having dementia. Uh, the difference is that with MCI, there is mild memory impairment, where in dementia, there is more significant uh, uh, memory impairment. Uh, in MCI, the other uh, cognitive domains are not affected, like, for example, language, uh, thinking, uh, judgment. Whereas in dementia, more than one cognitive domain would be affected. Uh, in mild cognitive impairment, it will not interf interfere with the daily life of the patient where it will with dementia. A patient with MCI is still able to work, he's still able to take care of himself where the patient with dementia will not. And not all cases of MCI would progress to dementia and sometimes they are reversible. Whereas uh, cases of dementia usually will progress over time. So how common is dementia? That's why I asked the question whether you came across a patient with dementia. Currently, there are more than 55 million people who live with dementia worldwide. And there are almost 10 million new cases every year with, a, with an average of new cases happening every three seconds all over the world. And dementia is currently the seventh leading cause of death among all diseases, and it's a major cause of disability and dependency among older people. And this slide is from uh, the WHO, and you can see the number of cases in 2018, 50 million, expected to reach uh, uh, 82 million by 2030 and 152 by 2050. And I would tell you, dementia is very expensive to treat, and it would it would cost a lot from the uh, uh, GDP of the countries. Actually, it's a very expensive uh, disease, and I can tell you this by handling the patient and knowing how much uh, how expensive the medication is, and the and the and the cost of healthcare. So the types of dementia, there are the five most common forms of dementia are Alzheimer's disease, which, which constitutes 60 to 70% of the cases, 
vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and mixed dementia. Again, dementia is the bigger umbrella. It's the broader umbrella that uh, describes the range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. And under, underneath this umbrella, it's the Alzheimer, it's the vascular that happens mainly with patients with diabetes, hypertension, and other vascular risk factors. Lewy body dementia, and in this case, we have dementia with Parkinsonian features. And frontotemporal dementia, which is rare, but it's difficult, and it affects, I mean, slightly younger patients with more of personality changes rather than uh, cognitive impairment. So what happens to the, uh, in the, inside the brain? And this is what I said before. Uh, okay. Uh, I hope my character is not clear, but you can see the size of the brain in a healthy brain uh, size, and then the shrunken brain with Alzheimer's disease. You can compare the difference. And then we have the plugs and the tangles, the plugs between the neurons and the tangles, which is the tau protein inside the neurons. So what are the signs and symptoms of dementia? Uh, people would say problems with the uh, 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 um, uh, me memory, actually. It's not only memory. It's not, uh, uh, it's not only a problem of remembering things. It's actually a problem of not being able to handle, uh, the patient would not be able to handle himself. He will get lost in familiar places. He will have difficulty solving problems. He will have uh, difficulties completing familiar tasks, which is, for example, putting on his clothes. He would find this very difficult to do. He will have uh, trouble with, 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 with images and space. He might see himself in the mirror and think it's somebody else. He will have difficulty uh, finding the right words when, when, when they talk. They would have uh, difficulties naming things even. I mean, he would know this is a table, but he will not be able to say it's a table. Uh, difficulty uh, solving problems, difficulty with finance, difficulty uh, with, uh, with, 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 with prayer, for example, he would forget how to pray. And he will, uh, most of the time, patients would draw from social activities. And this is when we say uh, dementia is usually accompanied by emotional changes and disturbance. Uh, progression. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, dementia is a slowly progressive uh, memory difficulties. Uh, it will start with the patient having troubles recalling recent events and ending up being totally dependent on the caregiver. And this goes into three main phases, mild, moderate, and severe. And here you can see and compare the size of the brain, which is healthy brain, the normal size of the, of the brain tissue. And this is what happens with mild Alzheimer's disease. And this is what happens with severe Alzheimer's disease on this side. You can see the shrunken size of the brain. So in mild Alzheimer's disease, there is loss of recent memory, like forgetting conversation and events that just happened. Uh, I mean, who came, who, who visited the patient, what breakfast he had this morning, for example. There is mood swing that involves depression or lack of interest. There is language problem, like trouble putting the, their thoughts into words or understanding others. And this stage can go unnoticed, unfortunately, unnoticed, and it can last for uh, 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 two, two to four years unnoticed. Unnoticed because patients think this is normal, normal part of aging. Uh, the family would not complain about it because they say, okay, it's normal part of aging. In moderate Alzheimer's disease, there is uh, the memory problem gets worse and start to cause uh, problems in daily life. Uh, patients will have hard time planning or solving problems. There is confusion about time, place, and person. He wouldn't know, uh, I mean, the place he is sitting, person he's talking to, his caregiver. Uh, the patient might wander or getting lost in familiar places, and this is uh, very difficult. A uh, patient will have delusions and hallucination. Delusion is a false, unshakable belief. So he will have like a certain delusion in mind uh, or, or, or a false idea, but he is consistent on it and, and informing the family about it and fighting with the family because of the delusion. 
and hallucination could be visual hallucination, could be auditory hallucination, it could be tactile hallucination where the patient would feel that uh, his body is covered with insects, and this is very common. He will have rumbling, rumbling speech, and the, this, uh, I mean, this stage again can last two to, to ten years, and this is a very difficult stage for the family to handle. Severe Alzheimer's disease, which is the, the, the last stage of Alzheimer, uh, here the patient ha is having major confusion about what is in the past and what's happening now. He cannot express himself or remember uh, the pro or process the information. Patient will have problems with swallowing and controlling the bladder and bowel. He, he or she might be bedridden. Uh, they will have extreme mood swing and cannot move e easily on their own, and this stage might last one to three years. So what are the causes? We spoke about the, uh, the symptoms, uh, what happens to the brain, but what causes Alzheimer? Uh, the science believe for most people, Alzheimer disease is caused by a combination of genetic factors, lifestyle factors, and environmental factors that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, affect the patient life over time. Uh, age is the most important risk factor. However, not all elderly will have Alzheimer, but age is the most important risk factor. Uh, other important risk factors are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and smoking. And this is what will cause mainly the vascular uh, the, uh, issues about Alzheimer. Other less frequent less risk factors include family history. It's less frequent. So you don't need to worry about it. Down syndrome, hearing loss, depression, and social isolation. Uh, how can we investigate and make sure it's a case of Alzheimer's dementia? We do, in the clinic, we do the cognitive and neurological testing, mini mental state examination, MOCA or mini COG and other uh, uh, tests. Uh, we do brain scan, which could be a CT scan, MRI, or PET scan that can show the function of the brain. Psychiatric evaluation might be needed, especially in cases of frontotemporal dementia. CSF uh, fluid test to see certain types of protein uh, available in the bone, in the uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, some blood test and genetic testing. And what's the treatment? Is there any treatment for dementia? Any idea? Just to keep you awake. Any treatment that you are aware? No. Okay. And. Mm -hmm. That uh, by the age of 50, the cells, the brain cells can really regenerate them, uh, themselves, but it's due to a certain type of food and by avoiding I such. Agree. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, management could be pharmacological management and non-pharmacological. What we have currently is acetylcholinesterase inhibitor therapy, which is donibizia and rivastigmine, other medication that I use in the clinic, uh, NMDA antagonist, which is memantine, Ibexa, the treatment. The, I mean, this is, not a this is not a treatment. This will slow down the progression of Alzheimer. It does not treat Alzheimer. It, it will not remove the, the, the plaques and tangles, but it will keep the patient like in the first stage for longer period rather than having a fast deterioration. Antipsychotic is used. Sometimes we, we have to use it if the patient is agitated for a while. Antidepressant could be used as well. Monoclonal antibody, which is anti-amyloid, it's a new treatment. Until now, there are a lot of debate about it, so we did not start it yet in Dubai. Uh, other treatment, ginkgo biloba extract, antioxidant, vitamin E and estrogen could have a role in some patients. For me, the most important non-pharmacological treatment is the family education. Family should understand the, uh, the, 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 the patient with dementia and what will happen to the patient with time. Uh, uh, they should maintain the patient function and reduce the disability that happens because of the dementia. Memory cues is important, like having a, a clear clock in the room where it says the time and the date and the, and the, and the patient might have, for example, pictures uh, of his uh, children with their names so he can remember them. 
safety issues at home, like having sensors to prevent fall or, 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 or an alarm if the patient is leaving the house. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it will prevent uh, the patient getting lost. Uh, LTC placement, long-term care placement could be uh, 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 an issue in later life. And end-of-life issues are very important to handle. And uh, it's very important to mention the caregiver because usually the caregiver is the forgotten person. He is the one who's handling the, the, the burden of, of taking care of a patient with dementia. Okay, going to prevention. Okay, we all know that we should keep active, check our hearing because I said hearing impairment could be a risk factor. Uh, stay socially connected. This is very important because social isolation could be a risk factor. Uh, avoid head trauma, do activities that you enjoy and love, eat healthy and look after your heart and keep active. I'm going to talk about mainly about the, the uh, sorry, I kept these two on the side because regular physical exercise was proven to be effective uh, for prevention, dementia, uh, prevention of dementia. And when I say regular physical exercise, I'm talking about twice weekly, 30 minutes interval exercise that could be maintained for a longer period of time and healthy diet. So let's go quickly to see the role of nutrition. And before going into the role of nutrition, just to mention that dietary intervention should be introduced as early as possible to minimize the risk of developing dementia. So I wouldn't start it in a patient in his 70s. I would advise everyone to start eating healthy from now because this will work. Here I'm going to touch upon Mediterranean diet, the Mayan diet, ketogenic, ketogenic diet, and the role of supplement. So quickly speaking about Mediterranean diet, and here you can see a PET scan uh, on the left and on the right. Here we are comparing the Mediterranean diet by a PET scan. And the red uh, area means uh, more brain activity compared to Western diet, which is full of fat, saturated fat, and a lot of meat. And here you can see less brain activity. So studies have found that patients who ate Mediterranean style diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grain and lean protein, exhibited fewer Alzheimer related changes in their brain compared to the Western diet. Okay, Mediterranean diet is usually rich with uh, antioxidant, fiber, omega-3, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and uh, it, it might have a protective effect against Alzheimer. The Mayan diet, uh, there was a trial uh, for the Mayan trial followed 923 individuals aged 58 to 98 for an average of 4.5 years. The diet was, uh, their diet was assessed using a 154 item guided questionnaire and different cognitive functions were, uh, were measured. And it was found that participant whose diet most closely followed the mind recommendation had a level of cognitive function that was uh, equivalent to a person 7.5 years or younger. So the MIND diet breaks its recommendation into 10 good brain diets to eat and five uh, bad brain diet to avoid. And this is quickly what the, what the MIND diet is suggesting to eat greens, veggie, berries, nuts, olive oil, whole grain, fish, beans, but, uh, uh, poultry, and red wine. And to avoid butter, cheese, red meat, fried food, and sweets. And this is what we know actually. Ketogenic diet, I'll just go quickly because there are not, I mean, enough evidence, uh, but it's simply a low carb and fat rich diet. Uh, its implementation has a fasting like effect, which brings the body into a state of ketosis. And here, for almost actually more than 100 years, it has been used as a therapy for drug resistant epilepsy, and it was working in some cases. We don't have a lot of evidence. Current studies indicate possible neuroprotection, neurocognitive protection, and few studies have evaluated the role of ketogenic diet in the prevention of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, but we, uh, I mean, we have not come across it and we don't have enough uh, evidence for it. Finally, any role for supplements, because this is what my patients ask me, can we take a supplement that would help us not, not to get dementia? And I would, just to, to summarize the slide before mentioning it, I would say no. A healthy diet would be more important than supplement. But 
let's see, for example, omega-3 fatty acid. It influenced several cardiovascular risk factors. We know this for sure, but the findings of the studies are mixed regarding the prevention of dementia. It might work or it might not work, but in all cases, it can help the heart. So vitamin B6, B12, and folate, there is some evidence that elevated serum homocysteine and low serum uh, level of folate and vitamin B6 and B12 might be associated with impaired cognitive functions. However, there is not enough or convincing evidence that the supplement can prevent dementia. Uh, vitamin D, again, there is some evidence that vitamin D deficiency is associated with cognitive impairment, but there is not enough evidence to support its role in prevention. Ginkgo biloba, several studies, although it's very famous, several studies showed no effect in preventing dementia or improving the cognitive functions. However, some patients are using it and they're happy with it. So all, all of these supplements, if a patient is using it and he or she felt better, then he can continue. But there is not enough evidence to support its role in prevention. So the take home message is that dementia is a syndrome in which there is deterioration in multiple cognitive domains like memory, thinking, orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning capacity, language, and judgment. Dementia is progressive and very expensive to treat or to manage. Non-pharmacological management requires caregiver training and being able to understand the disease and contain the patient. Uh, prevention requires lifestyle modification and risk factor control. And the most important thing for this conference is that dietary intervention should be introduced as early as possible to minimize the risk of developing dementia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salva, for that very interesting presentation. Um, we are running short on time, so we will be going for any questions for five minutes. Uh, so I would like to invite the panel up for the questions. Do I have to wait for the panel? Did, do you want okay, to come okay. up for the uh, question and answers, or you can ask them directly? It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question for the Salwa. First, thank you all for the excellent presentation. Uh, I want just to ask you, Dr. Salwa, about uh, reduced dementia. What about reading books, Quran, yes. Yes. Uh, stories, smart yes. games? Do you think that will reduce the Definitely, dementia? definitely, yes. Uh, because uh, there is no time to explain more about dementia, but simply there are, there are two types of intelligence our brain would have. Something called solid intelligence and fluid intelligence. Solid intelligence is whatever we have learned when we were young something that we, 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 we studied very well, like Quran, like certain songs, for example, happy birthday to you, everyone knows this. Uh, knowledge, uh, uh, I mean, uh, vocab, everything that we have studied very well when we were young is called solid intelligence. And this will remain for patients with dementia versus fluid intelligence is something that we learn later. And it depends on problem solving. Okay, and, and not, not something that we would know it by heart. So we know this very well. And recently there was a, a recent study, I mean, at, in, on the first week of May, stating that it, uh, it's very important to have a very high level or a solid level of education at high school. This will prevent us from having uh, dementia later, later on. So I totally agree. I came across a lot of patients who would forget everything except Quran. I have a comment, uh, Dr. Here, here, next to you, Dr. Hello. The lady. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Victor. Uh, so, as I'm a clinical dietitian, I do see a lot of cases of dementia. Mm. People tend to think that they're only underweight, they will start losing weight. But remember, they forget a lot. So, all the time, our patients come and say, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, yes, I'm yes. hungry, I'm hungry. Yes. 
And the problem is that we start feeding, 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 and we end up with obesity and gaining weight. Yes. So I would just recommend the Mediterranean, it's excellent and perfect, just increase the fiber content for mm. these patients so they can feel set, full and satisfied and don't ask for food that much. That's yeah, they will, they will, with all my respect, they will still keep on asking for food every yes. five minutes. Yes. And what, what I tell the caregiver is that every time they ask for food, give them a very small portion. Don't serve the food in, I mean, in a big tray where the patient would get confused. Always serve a very small portion at a time. And keep in mind that even after finishing food, he will say, after five minutes, I'm hungry, I didn't eat. My name is Milla, I'm a clinical dietitian. I have two questions for Dr. Selwa. Mm. Uh, for the patient who has uh, Alzheimer, do you think it's better to wake up the patient and tell him the truth or okay and uh, say exactly what he's telling? Okay, this is very interesting. I always, uh, I mentioned dementia can go into stages, stage one, stage two, or mild, moderate, severe. And I mentioned something about the end of life and life plan and the patient having the autonomy to select the type of care that he or she would like to have. Patient at the very beginning, uh, the, 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 the early stages of dementia, they have an insight and they should be told that they are having dementia so that they can plan their life and they can, if they, if, if they have anything in mind, they should do it or a patient can make a decision about how he or she would like to, to, to be cared for when he's in advanced dementia. So if it is an early stage of dementia, then it's always the right of the patient to know. But if it is mild to moderate, uh, sorry, if it is moderate to severe, then even if you tell him, I mean, he wouldn't uh, be able to understand it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sabra, for informative information about the dementia. My question, there is any relation between the stroke and dementia? Yes. Is dementia, it is, lead, is stroke leads to dementia yes. or it is yes. Yes. <laughs> separate? This is, no, this is the vascular dementia. With, with Alzheimer, it's usually progressive dementia, okay? If it is pure Alzheimer disease that is mentioned by Alois Alzheimer, which is related to the protein, there is a progressive, de a progressive deterioration of memory. With vascular dementia, which, is, which I mean stroke, if a patient is having a stroke, then after the stroke, he will have sudden deterioration of his cognitive function. Then if he gets another stroke, stroke, he will get another sudden deterioration. So we call it as a step, a step down deterioration that is related to stroke. So stroke can cause dementia, yes, for sure. And the 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 the, 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 the all the vascular risk factors can cause a stroke, which stroke can cause dementia. Yes. Thank you so much. Can I ask one last question? Okay. Very quick. Okay. Very quick. Uh, doctor, we know. Uh, first of all, thank you to all our speakers for the very interesting uh, lectures. And doctor, I have a question. Um, we know that with the diabetes, it is known that. Uh, uh, from the diagnosis, we have 15 years until the complications will show. Is it applicable and is it the same for Alzheimer? And do genetic tests, are they effective on this level? Let's say if we know that we already got them in our genes and we are predisposed, is it effective to prevent? Okay, for, uh, I would say the, the, the plaques and tangles that was there or the amyloid uh, deposition that was there in the brain can happen 20 years before the onset of the clinical uh, 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 the, the diagnosis or manifestation of dementia. So this is again applicable to all the risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, they all work the same. Uh, so, uh, so we always say prevention is always better. So by controlling these risk factors, controlling diabetes, hypertension, making sure we are enrolled into a healthy lifestyle very early. Going back to the question of genetic testing, I wouldn't advise, to, advise it to be done. Even if we are, for example, there is a certain gene called ApoE4. 
if it is there, it would increase your chance of having dementia. But if it, or Alzheimer specifically. But even if the if the if if the gene is there and you are you are you are living a healthy lifestyle, you are exercising regularly, you are keeping your brain active. I mean, you are involved in social activities. Your your diet is healthy. You might not get dementia. So I wouldn't advise to go for genetic testing because it would it would I mean make patients so anxious about it. You're welcome.